I don't know. Do you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so welcome to uh, our uh, keynote uh, lecture to the, for today. It's a great pleasure to see you. With some of you, I have corresponded via email. My name is Lubomir Pujerliev. I'm a, a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the Komode project based in Leipzig at the Leibniz Institute for, uh, uh, for Regional Geography. Uh, uh, it's a great, great pleasure at first to see you all and then to, to be the moderator of today's keynote of our uh, colleague and friend, uh, Tonio Weicker. Tonio Weicker used to be um, a, a colleague and fellow at our institute for a long while, actually. Just recently, he moved to Goethe Uni University in Frankfurt, uh, a mine, uh, where he has a brand new position within a new project uh, dealing with the energy and the Green Deal, if I understand, in the Rhine Mine region. Um, previously, he was a fellow at another project which was run uh, at our institute, which was called P P Put Space, Public tra Transport as Public Space. He uh, defended his uh, PhD at the Technical uh, University of Berlin. Uh, several years ago, and now uh, he he will show us part of his, I would say, previous work, not from what he's do doing now, and we are very, or at least I am very excited to, 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 to hear it and then to have the discussion with you. Thank you very much. Tonio? Thank you so much, Lubo. I hope I can navigate the, the microphone. Yeah, I'm very, I'm super happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I think already the first day was uh, super interesting, um, many insights, and I will somehow also continue the discussion today on uh, what I would frame as knowledge governance, um, I, I would say, and, and, and how SAMP is a major player in knowledge governance when it comes to transport planning um, all over the world. Um, <coughs> Um, yeah, so um, I would maybe start uh, um, to introduce the structure of my talk today. Um, I will first give some background information about um, sustainable urban mobility plans as a policy package. Um, not so much as a transport planning tool. Um, however, it always self-describes itself or the stakeholders describe it as a planning tool and that's also something that, that is key for me. There's a difference that, that we are always speaking just about transport planning uh, and not about policies, but it is actually very, very much about uh, policies and this is clearly a strategy to also push away responsibility um, as uh, at least in my understanding and um, so if you, uh, if you succeed, uh, you, 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 um, um, you, you have done it right and it's our tools that provide you the success. If you fail, it's your responsibility but not ours. So a very easy way to push away um, responsibility. <coughs> um, Secondly, I'm then going to trace changes of the SUM program while expanding from an inner EU policy into an internationally applied transport planning package. And I think that's, that's a very interesting point to see and it's normally not, um, not researched uh, and also not mentioned so much that it used to be an inner EU policy at the beginning and at some point uh, traveled abroad, how I would uh, put it, um, which then also brings in all the dependency, the financial dependency, um, um, spoke about yesterday with uh, EBRD loans, uh, etc. <coughs> and at the end of this first section, I'm then going to also present current developments and reapplication, and that also brings me to my new position because indeed it is also about sustainable transport mobility transitions in uh, in Hessen and in Germany. And SAMs are um, suddenly <laughs> um, very popular in Germany again. Um, so that's also a side note, and um, I think, uh, again, also the development is very interesting to look at here. Um, in the second part, I will give you a bit of um, empirical insights from my fieldwork in uh, Lviv, Ukraine. It's uh, data is mainly from 2019 and 2020, and uh, in Tirana, where I've uh, been doing fieldwork in uh, 2021 and 2022. Um, also looking at uh, some implementation there. Some of the points will be familiar <laughs> and um, similar to Tbilisi, um, others will uh, differ. Um, 
Um, and then, <coughs> so I think, and lastly, I will sum these observations by suggesting theoretical arguments, um, yeah, and which I hope then to be somehow, yeah, be helpful uh, to really understand what I see as a multi-layered knowledge governance uh, of uh, SAMP policies. Um, I see SAMP initiatives as an in instructive example of globally circulating uh, policy mobilities, perpetuating a sustainability paradigm captured by classic uh, neoliberal ideas of regional competition for global capital. And moreover, also SAMP initiatives take local education programs and training more and more serious. The applied program um, is still somehow um, increases knowledge hierarchies. <clears throat> For instance, Ruin, I think that's something that we haven't um, discussed yet um, through mobility indexes and through data governance. And I think um, the SAMP um, policy package is also very much about um, collecting data and, and using data to build a knowledge hub. Um, which again then gives uh, gives power also to um, to introduce themselves and also to 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 put yourself on the agenda of being the one with transport planning knowledge and um, to to being able to provide um, support uh, to the rest of the world. <clears throat> Okay, um, having this said, I will be rather critical about SAMS, but I also want to disclaim that I'm well aware that um, SAMP initiatives are often based on um, uh, on yeah, local citizen movements or um, on, on, on people who really want to somehow foster change. And indeed, it also provides leeway for more progressive planning policy. So I also feel this ambivalence, let's say, <clears throat> that I'm very sympathetic with the, with the stakeholders in the cities who somehow want to push progressive transport policies. Um, but I think as SAMP is a very influential program and it is normally praised and there's really not enough critical <laughs> um, studies and, um, and scholars who are dealing with um, SAMPs, it is very important to, to, to also point towards shortcomings uh, rather than pra praising a seemingly successful policy program. Okay, long introduction. <laughs> I try to be a bit... Um, Okay, <clears throat> so let's turn to sustainable urban mobility plans. Some can be described um, as the EU Commission's attempt to provide a holistic one-fits-all concept to initiate transport reforms in European cities. From a superficial view, SAMP is indeed nothing more than a transport master plan that cities have developed for ages. However, with a special focus on sustainable planning, um, and of course, there are a few arguments that are repeatedly um, brought up uh, by proponents of the program. This is, of course, the, the, the participation, um, the participatory methods that, that, that are involved. Um, uh, there is a call for balanced development of all transport modes with the limitation that uh, external costs of respective mobility means should be counted in. And um, of course, and also a very important point um, is the implementation plan that is normally publicly announced and that there is normally a monitoring process and an evaluation um, that somehow should provide the, the opportunity to yeah, engage into public discussion afterwards and over the process and also in the future. <coughs> So SAMPs are, again, ideally in its self-description, uh, really not more than a toolbox of planning instruments. <clears throat> and um, again, I want to stress that this then also gives rise to SUMI, to Sustainable Urban Mobility Index, which is monitoring and evaluating the quality of sustainable transport reforms in Europe and beyond. Um, here and in even large parts of the literature, some appear then as a rather static sequence of transport policy, which can be applied, and when applied in the suggested way, would lead to better, more livable cities. <coughs> So this is the main narrative, and luckily there are at least a few sources <laughs> which, which are critical um, and also self-critical assessments by st stakeholders involved, um, which uh, can be found. And um, <coughs> they state that uh, some effects are limited yeah, um, because uh, due, especially due to inappropriate financing and uh, short-term implementation cycles, 
um, that uh, they are limited due to the absence of exnovation strategy, which means, um, like, yeah, as I said, as I said before, these anti-car policies, like really pushing uh, cars out of uh, city centers. For instance, normally you have a mixture of of of, of pull and push measures, but uh, not like uh, really radical approaches. And some is also not supporting these kind of approaches because they are also very difficult to implement, of course. <coughs> And then, of course, they um, they produce this dependency on foreign consultancy knowledge, um, which we talked about yesterday. <coughs> on a more general level, um, some have been criticized by uh, scholars for also not reaching their sustainability goals um, in different spheres. So they are lack lasting success with knowledge transfer. <laughs> they contribute to socio-spatial disparities in cities and to social inequality, and largely do not reach emission mitigation goals, at least to these three scholars. Uh, as I said, there is really um, a lack of uh, studies that are um, evaluating sums as such. Um, nevertheless, already from this short overview, one could really ask the question why SUMS are uh, such a successful program, <laughs> although not producing the promised outcomes, and why they are keep failing forward, let's say, and why they are actually praised and as one of the, of the main EU programs that are repeatedly <coughs> um, uh, pushed forward and promoted for in the EU and on a global level. And yeah, I think the answer lies in the fact that SAMS cannot be sufficiently, of course, described as, as a planning tool, but need to be contextualized in global regimes of development policies and knowledge governance. So let me trace a bit the um, knowledge governance, and I'd suggest we have a short look into the history of SAMS. Um, sustainable urban mobility plans were firstly discussed and developed as planning policies uh, in 1992. Um, so they clearly refer back to Bundland uh, Commission report, um, which had um, significant effects on environment policies in the European Union. Um, however, it took another decade for the urban mobility package um, in uh, in 2000. Uh, no, actually, no, 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 no. In 2008, um, the first the, the policy package package was introduced. Um, um, before that, I will. You can read the definition. I think it, it's 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 important to <laughs> to see what some is leading to to also then evaluate uh, where they are um, lagging behind. Um, but I I will not uh, read it out loud. Um, so in 2008, <coughs> it was then um, introduced as a proper um, um, policy um, fostering change for EU, um, cities within the EU. And yeah, the point, maybe you read it on the slides, the point I wanted to make here is um, that from the very beginning, you can see this colonial um, attitude. Um, it was really designed by a German transport consultancy, and um, the best practices behind were all from uh, UK, France, and Germany itself. Um, so there's not much of really diverse uh, knowledge involved. And yeah, that's also some of my claims. So from the very beginning, SAMS were developed as a soft policy instrument to standardize European transport landscapes and to redistribute significant funding of the EU to European cities um, through different funding lines, as well as research projects and citizen initiatives. <coughs> and I think there are actually two important points to make about the success of SAMS. Um, the first one is that SAMS were used as a government tool to, to intervene into EU cities uh, by bypassing national transport policies. So the self-proclaimed initial observation was that cities are supposedly ready to do more than the national states, um, and that the EU tries to port these, support these initiatives. So in, the sense, in a sense, the program is also used to criticize EU member states for lagging behind. Um, and um, by appreciating the attempts of European cities and by also awarding certain European cities for, for, for doing great progress. <coughs> and the second point I want to make here in the, for this early stage is that it's really quite interesting to see how the EU, starting as a rather weak actor um, with no decision rights in transport policy sector of the member states or the cities, was able to establish itself in a very powerful position, often evaluating authority. 
So in a way, the success of the SUM program enables the EU Commission to evaluate the quality of sustainable transport reforms uh, in Europe and beyond. <clears throat> so it is the EU which introduces hierarchies of best practices, which awards cities, which recognizes missing steps in the SUM guidelines and also encourages other EU cities to start their process. <clears throat> so not least in the EU gathering data about cities through some monitoring and evaluation, setting a framework of good planning practices and establishing a hub for knowledge, resources and transport planning. And I think this is even more obvious when we are start looking uh, on recent SAM programs outside the EU. It's actually not so recent. Um, it's already for, for, for seven years that some programs are went outside the EU, normally aligned with um, development agencies like um, GIS or um, the IFD, so the, um, yeah, the, the French uh, <laughs> counterpart. Um, so, again, the EU is using this progressive city department's argument to push reforms through some initiatives, which then as a second step should lead to national agreements on loans and financial support for PT reforms. Um, SAMs in cities of European neighborhood are increasingly applied um, as a conditionality policy, I, at least that's how I read it. So a major difference is that EU cities in principle were able to finance SAMs on their own, while SAMs outside the EU largely depend on these foreign resources, <coughs> um, which of course major, makes a great difference. But also beyond the financial dependency, there is, of course, the question whether planning tool that was um, developed uh, to customize urban conditions and planning standards uh, within the EU is actually suitable to be applied in very diverse contexts around the globe. And, well, I think there are many arguments to make why this is problematic. <laughs> um, but I would just stay uh, with the individuals, um, with, in, um, with the... Um, uh, I would just stay with a policy brief here from um, Rudolf and Damat, uh, claiming that SAMs are majorly successful when they uh, came with massive investments into public transport infrastructure. And um, so it's, it's, it's actually really funny to, to read through this document because they are um, important stakeholders from transport consultancy who are pushing forward these reforms, and they are trying to make an argument why SAMs are successful. But, um, but needs to still need to, uh, to improve. Um, and as you can see, <coughs> the, so it is indeed that only with large investments into public transport um, you can have some effect on, on, on the model shift. <coughs> Uh, however, SAMP itself is not able, and I think people in the room know that, uh, to, to, to provide these kind of uh, investments. Um, SAMP... Um, um, <coughs> Um, so SAMs normally in, in many cities when you don't have like, like the support of, 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 of the nation states or different um, kind of uh, donor programs, mo mostly focusing on cycling or walkability in city centers. And of course there's nothing wrong with better sidewalks and separated cycling paths, but this is far from the substantial measure needed to solve respectively dramatic traffic situations in many, um, many cities that SAMs uh, have been applied to. So again, the EU rationale to work with cities rather than countries turns out to be vitally inefficient when it comes to lasting improvements in cities' transport sector. And I'm not the only one who mentioned that, so I should be fair to, to state that um, the more recent development policies in the transport sector and also in development policies have been um, discussing these issues, and so from some are now turning into NUMS, <laughs> so there are these uh, national support programs and the idea to, to somehow bring in nation state as an agency from the very beginning. And what is even more interesting um, is that uh, current, so the current draft of, uh, in the EU Commission that is currently discussed from the EU Council <coughs> is making this claim for, for, for EU countries as well, so that there will be a third wave of some um, um, initiatives in the EU supported from the nations, um, and which also uh, comes down to obligatory sums in uh, all major EU cities.
Okay. Um, then I would switch to the case study so um, and give you like just a bit of evidence from some implementation process in Lviv and Tirana, giving just a quick overview how the sustainable transport transitions there are implemented. In Lviv, you can actually look back to a decade of um, sustainable transport planning and substantial effort. Um, what is interesting to observe is the deep involvement of GIZ and the successful application of EBRD funds. Um, the entire planning period was monitored by German and Swiss um, consultancies. <coughs> As Lviv is much more advanced in its SAMP adoption than Tirana, I will present just some of the noteworthy results of the reform. Lviv also is a city with significantly less financial um, resources and comparable EU cities was able to generate quite significant funding for uh, fleet modernization. <coughs> um, besides Lviv city council majorly refurbished, for instance, the main plaza in front of the railway station, uh, 120 kilometers of cycling roads, um, better public transport connections, um, and also separated bus lanes. And I think this Sounds impressive, and indeed, I would say it is actually very impressive what they achieved, but still maybe a bit also in um, contrast to what was said yesterday, I um, would somehow claim that um, uh, considering questions of social justice, I uh, at least have my doubts, and uh, this is for, for three reasons um, why I think that uh, citizens um, have clearly um, to face uh, adverse effects from, from these reforms. And um, first of all, fares have significantly increased over the some implementation process. As leaves doubled, if you're um, not, uh, um, um, if you're not having these e-ticket cards, it has even tripled over the last years. Of course, there's also inflation and and, and other influences, <coughs> but still, the fare increases are definitely something to mention. Um, also, I think massive investment in, in, in the city center, in cycling um, infrastructure, also in public space distribution, um, when it is only focused on very central spots, of course has then, then a problem that, that, you, that you have socio-spatial disparities in the cities. Um, and you can see that because public transport usage actually declined and um, from first service that, that the, the group from some development team um, uh, published itself is indicating at least that there's also a change from public transport users rather from low income groups that are rather leaving public transport to middle class usage in the city center. So we have really have problems with transport uh, poverty in the suburbs. <coughs> And uh, yeah, a similar story in Tirana, actually more brutal, I would say, because in Tirana we, we, we actually have the, the case that, um, it is, that the SAMP is widely alienated from daily passenger needs and by daily mobility patterns. Um, we have a clear focus on the city center again and on tourist needs, so there is this idea of, of, of having a railway to the, to the uh, Tirana airport. <laughs> I think in Tbilisi you have something to say about that as well. Um, <clears throat> and there's no indicated strategy for feeding services in peri-urban regions. You, um, some of you might know that Tirana has a large sprawling area, uh, ag ag agglomerated area, and there's no strategy, not, not so whatever. And so I think it's really problematic to, to actually publish <laughs> such a plan with, without even noticing these kinds of social struggles. Okay, <laughs> um, we can also come back to this when we um, um, during the discussion. Um, for me, I would say these 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 observations round up in let's for say four theoretical arguments, um, and I would somewhat try to grasp the multi-layered character of some implementation processes. Um, I find Zwingedu's concept of 
policy mobility is very helpful, which would allow to explain how sums produce a post-political sphere characterized by confused responsibilities, something that I was mentioning at the very beginning, uh, and the market of knowledge dissemination without quality control. And that's, that's somehow ironic because SAMP is always claiming to, to have monitoring, but in the end, um, some stakeholders are not responsible for, for failure. And, um, <clears throat> and all this is, of course, deeply embedded in a global sustainable paradigm, which reproduces neoliberal competition for capital while equalizing sustainable um, city solutions with economic growth. <clears throat> Moreover, I have talked about the importance of data governance in some frameworks, which from the perspective of sociology of translation can be interpreted as the EU's successful attempt to speak in the name of a greater um, good by collecting knowledge resources to frame the discourses on progressive transport planning now and in the future. <clears throat> and lastly, of course, this um, aligns to Schwanen's call for transport justice through decolonized knowledge, an endeavor that would need to invest thought into alternative mobility futures and the epistemological precondition that enables or denies alternative thinking in respective transport settings. And so I would argue that the success of the sum themes to capitalize on accepted knowledge hegemonies, creating a sphere of no reasonable alternative which is beneficial for Western transport consultancies as well as for local decision makers when making it easy to um, silencing opposing voices. Some seem to function as a mean to set a dispositive of transport modernization, clearly framing the way of how transport reforms have to look like, how they are, they have to be evaluated, and what it is meant to be a sexual reform and what not. So uh, I have one last slide. I could also end here, <laughs> but um, I would maybe then also like to state that Sams and Tirana and Lviv are, I think, very telling examples how um, transport reform in the name of sustainability goals can also play against the interests of local citizens um, and increase urban injustice and social spatial disparities. This is, again, not to blame the effort of some initiatives as such, but to criticize the performativity, let's say, of replicating best practices in transport planning. Not because the concepts would fit particularly well, but just because they are fundable by foreign donors. <coughs> So some create high expectations around city administrations and citizens, but might lead to misinvestments in public transport infrastructure if not sensitively adopted in the city. <coughs> but yeah, the last point, and I think I've pointed that out quite a bit, uh, is again about hierarchized knowledge regimes uh, when local transport planners have to be consulted in order to get funded. This underlying attitude prevents low-key solutions develop out of local knowledge resources, as well as potential beneficial mutual learning from different concepts and ideas. <clears throat> so as long as these knowledge hierarchies are reproduced, cities are replacing underfunded public transport systems by infrastructure endeavors for an upper middle class, which in turn will rather increase space segregation as well as motorization rate when reproducing a clearly misleading sustainable transport planning paradigm. So that would be it. <laughs> I know it's super critical, um, but I think it's also fun to discuss it and, and also maybe to criticize me. I thought, of course, there's a, a different opinion to that. I'm sure there are different opinions in the room. But thank you so much for now. <laughs> Uh, many thanks, uh, Tonio. Uh, I think we, we have uh, many points for to start a great discussion. So the floor is yours. Uh, I myself have at least two questions to you, but I'll keep them if there is time for that. So we have one, uh, uh, approximately almost half an hour to do, to, to ask Tonio. Uh, and I will try to, to navigate. I'm, please pardon me because I don't know your names or not yet. I hopefully I will learn them in, in the course of time. So I see a hand here, then a second there. Third. So please go ahead. Uh, Lela, do you want me to uh, carry the uh, Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, I had a question uh, regarding if you could please 
uh, switch back to the slide when there was statistic for model split by different cities. Uh, it was, yeah, yeah, this one. Uh, so uh, we see that uh, uh, like um, for uh, most of the cities, the share of car usage is higher than Lvov. And these are like kind of developed first world uh, cities with SAMP, with all this kind of fancy planning, but we still see these cars more frequently than uh, Lviv, uh, which is not so rich. And, uh, does this uh, mean that actually uh, this SAMP and all these efforts, they just don't do anything and it's all about um, uh, like uh, income, which is probably correlate in correlation with the car usage. So city gets richer and they use more cars. And whatever you do with some with uh, sustainable transport, it just doesn't make any difference. It's very pessimistic, but that's what yeah. I see from it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an excellent point. Um, and I would say, um, I mean, of course, there's this, there's this tendency, and I think this correlation is also well proved that with, uh, with higher incomes, there comes more car usage and more car ownership rates, um, higher car ownership rates. Um, however, what I think is really a problem is that we try um, to, 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 um, to, to implement solutions that do not work in, in wealthier uh, cities with, with higher income and very high car uh, ownership, um, pulling out, uh, so really with pulling measures, trying to somehow convince um, the upper middle class to, to, to maybe switch from, from the car to public transport, a concept that is highly questionable, as we heard before uh, in, in the last talks and over the, over the day, um, and, um, and a Apply it to cities with very different, um, with, with very different situation and conditions. So um, I don't know if you can do anything about it, but I think it's not a good idea to 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 to, to apply a concept that is uh, that is failing in uh, in the in the welfare context uh, and uh, to try to reduce car ownership with that. So um, yeah, I I agree with the point. Uh, thank you very much for this thought-provoking talk. And actually, my question is directly related. You mentioned the problems that come with SAMS when kind of they're transferred into non-EU cities. And I was just wondering, um, the questions that you raise, especially regarding transport justice and social justice, how do they relate also to EU cities that uh, implement SAMS? Um, actually, all the critical studies that I've cited in the first slides are all focusing on EU cities. There's simply no um, no research on non-EU cities, so I would not agree. So um, it's it's definitely not the case that um, some is is uh, not doing harm in EU cities as well. Let's put it like that. But um, of course, there are uh, different. Opportunity. So, if some sums are aligned in uh, in cities with with high investment into public transport infrastructure, so if they are on top of an already very progressive transport policy, of course, um, they can have beneficial outcomes, um, and they they often do have beneficial outcomes. But uh, in general, what we see from the statistics when when it, when it comes, for instance, to to climate goals and 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 air quality, we have really bad results. So um, it's so it's really not working, and that it's it's applied for 15 years, and uh, it has always praised as a success, but um, yeah. No, there's no critical discourse about it. All right. I see, so first there on the back, then Lela, and I saw two more hands. Uh, hello, my name is Mariam, and um, I work for Green Alternative, and uh, I've been monitoring uh, Tbilisi's public transport reform and how it's going. And I just wanted to echo your presentation because as of now we do not have SAMP, but it's uh, under preparation and it's been under preparation for quite some time, three or four years now. Um, but the negative effects that you have mentioned, we are feeling it even without uh, having SAMP yet. 
For instance, we, we had last year a fare hike, which doubled um, um, uh, the fare for a majority of transport users, not uh, for those that are uh, using um, some social support, uh, it remained. And we also see that most of the effort is concentrated around the city center, and then uh, in the suburbs we still have to face uh, the consequences of um, this uh, really reform that lags behind because we do not see that we will move faster or more efficiently or with more dignity. Uh, and I don't use the car, I use public transport and I commute from a suburb and I need an hour and a half and I experience this very inequal and, and disparity uh, every day. Um, so just to comment and give you a sort of um, this um, background of what's happening in Tbilisi. And also uh, our organization, we have really tried to push City Hall to have this uh, SAMP prepared. And we don't, ha we have not pushed uh, the City Hall because we think that this is an amazing tool. But we just want to know what the City Hall wants to do and to understand what uh, they are doing and what uh, time frames when things will be done. And for us, it's um, the only thing that um, offers us this sort of solution, just to understand what the city wants to do. And uh, then I have a question. Um, you have mentioned that there are negative consequences uh, to some implementation in certain cities. And I wonder what could be done to mitigate these negative effects if there are also some solutions to it. Thanks. Thanks a lot to, for sharing also these insights. Um, of course, I have no answer to the question. I, I, I wouldn't be here probably <laughs> if, I, if I had the answer. Um, but I also want to, to comment. I, um, I will also say something to the question. But um, I also want to comment on the transparency and what you mentioned, that you just want to know and you want somehow to push the, the city hall to um, to make clear what they are aiming at. And I think that's that's something I, I you, one really should point out. Um, so also from my interviews in Lviv with, with the ones who, had, who were um, evolving, some they said that this was really something that they got involved and they were young people starting from, from with, an, in, with an activist movement and then switched to the, to the transport departments, which was also then built and, and built with new people. And they somehow they said that for them, the, pro the, pro um, the program and the entire SUM process was something like an entry ticket to, to at least get knowledge what where the transport policy is heading at. So I can very well understand and, and underline this point that this already is a success in a way, but the question is whether we need SUM for, or, um, um, and the, the, the entire colonial package, let's say, that's behind it. Um, yeah, for the question, I mean, yeah, I think harsher policies are more, I mean, that's, I think, the, the, the only way. Um, I, I was very interested what Nikolai said in the, uh, uh, in the last session about agglomerated areas. So um, I, I wonder why there is no master plan that is starting from the suburbs that is really focusing um, and is really um, putting, um, putting most investments in these, in these kinds of things. And also in the feeder service, I think there's, there's, there's also a lot of knowledge about that, but, but normally it is not... Um, it is at least not coming through, and it's not as publicly, publicly discussed as problems and struggles in the city center. So um, that could be a, a way, and then, of course, um, yeah, push, push measures, I would say. <laughs> All right, thanks. So first, uh, Yulia Remenko, then Kuala Zerovaisky. Hi, I have a question regarding EU fund. So if a city have SAMP, uh, is a city more likely to receive EU funding for the public transport development? Or if they don't have and they asking for specific funding for just one transport line, if it's possible still to receive funding? And do you know some cases when they receiving funding for the project but was acting against uh, the sum? Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm not not 
not the expert on that, but, but um, what I know is, of course, it increases your chances and often, um, so all these GIZ programs that are implemented in Ukraine and, and, and in many other cities, also in Southeastern Europe, there are a couple of initiatives, um, they normally go, go, go in line and it's clear that um, these, that the sum process is intertwined with the application for, for, for EBRD. Also, it is not like mandatory or anything. Um, but it's also clear that without the EBRD loans, um, um, there, there, there will be no, there normally will be no progress. So, so, so in a way, I think for all stakeholders, it's clear. Um, but what, what we have, of course, it, and I think we have, we heard it yesterday from the, um, from the uh, expert from Batumi, I, I don't remember the, the, the name, that, that you have the a very successful implementation of some maybe, but then policy stakeholders who do not push it for further. And um, I, I would actually say that most initiatives uh, stop after after implementation, and it then really is just another document that that maybe has also some results and um, will also then keep the discussion going, but, but which is not then somehow translating into funding and on, into progressive policies. So we see that quite quite a bit. Much better. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. I wanted actually to ask uh, you partly answered already actually um, about the implementation uh, are there some research uh, which uh, I, I mean uh, do um, are there some researches which uh, covers uh, the process of implementation and the reflection on it especially in terms of uh, uh, indicators because of course you have to uh, understand what's going on and uh, follow the in special indicators. Uh, you have to perform special survives year by year, uh, and probably uh, to uh, about two cases you mentioned, two cities, or probably in broader view. And if, uh, for instance. Uh, there's some examples when SOMP really doesn't work. Uh, probably you know uh, some examples uh, how consultants explain that. So why our decisions didn't work, actually. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, so, um, I think the, the, the point um, you, you're mentioning is about the, the knowledge governance again and, and the data governance and, and I think that's also the, 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 um, one of the main issues why they um, want uh, this new program from, from EU Commission to, to also have this obligatory um, um, implementation of SUMS. The idea here is clearly to uh, gather better data because uh, one problem of SAMP, and SAMP has also have been criticized for it, that um, of course the, the guideline give all the, um, all the opportunity to, to have a monitoring system and an evaluation study afterwards, but uh, often it is not done. And there's also, like from the method methodology-wise, it is very, very open. Uh, you can make a survey and ask, ask citizens. Uh, you can do like yeah, scientific um, testing, how the air quality improves or decreases. So you really have, um, you, you have a very broad range of what you can evaluate afterwards. And you can, and in the sum process, you can define on your own so far what, what you actually want to know afterwards and what you want, where you want to have your indicators and what you want to achieve. And that's where the SUMI actually comes into play, the Sustainable Urban Mobility Index. So they want to standardize the, the monitoring process and the evaluating process to have quite better knowledge of how EU transport policies are progressing. Um, to then also be able to, to, to intervene. Um, this is, of course, yeah, like a, a gigantic data gathering machine <laughs> for the future. Yeah. But, uh, Thanks, I saw. Yeah, if I may, I wanted to comment on the previous question whether or not SAMPs translate into better access to funding. And in case of Batumi, they do have uh, translated. Uh, because uh, it was uh, used uh, as a police document officially adopted by the city hall uh, to uh, get financing from EBRD for electric buses as well as Euro 5 uh, diesel buses. 
Uh, moreover, to get a, a sovereign loan from KFW Bank for ITS system, it's I think more than 10 millions. And also to have some in-depth uh, uh, research on walkability and also safe roads to school. Uh, so this all, the premise for financing all those was that the city had officially adopted some in, in case of Baton. To my understanding, that's rather a comment. Do you want to engage uh, with that or no? Um, uh, there was also the question about um, if I know an example that went particularly bad, I don't want to blame any city, but I think one example where you can learn a lot from is, for, for instance, Duris, also in Albania, which have implemented the SUMP very early on. Um, and uh, it didn't translate into funding, and um, they had a bit of uh, parking rearrangements and street uh, rearrangement, but again, it really, as a, I mean, the situation was much worse than it used to be before, and, and, and uh, also, like, the, again, the political will was uh, played, played against um, the, yeah, the, the, the intervention of, 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 of some stakeholders. Lela, you wanted also to uh, ask or no? It's um, my questions or my concerns are <laughs> over time being addressed. I, my, my thoughts were also about, you know, how SAMPs are linked to specific financing tools. Um, just as a stipulation, my feeling is that pretty much urban public transport is a new frontier for financial capital. Um, and this is a big statement, but I just wanted to ask if you would dare to stipulate on these terms, right? This is, it seems to me that the policy tools are actually also created and disseminated, already having in mind urban transport as uh, possible investment opportunities. And if we think about it, this is a very safe investment opportunity because the governments, either national or municipal governments, have to back up the debts that are being taken for these purposes. Um, this is also, this type of financing schemes are also what, uh, in the end, like very often stands behind the need to raise fares because the debts are taken on the condition that the revenues will be generated. Um, so this was what I wanted to kind of draw you in um, to stipulate about, I, just to make a reference with what, uh, with what Louise was t uh, telling today about, you know, micro rayons and this hyper mobility. I mean, this, this is another sector where it's clear that international financial institutions are promoting new urban redesign ideas, which again will serve as um, investment frontiers. This means like taking all the concentrated the, the urban services back to neighborhoods. This might require a lot of uh, financial investment. The trick is that, of course, first, that there used to be such concepts around that were deconstructed. But another trick is on which terms such new investments will be made. So if, if I can push you to think with me on these lines, I'd be very happy. But I'm also very accepting if you say, Leila, you're hypothesizing too far. Um, I would say that what I wanted to point out is somehow the other coin, uh, the other side of the coin. So I think that, of course, that's 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 part of the story. This this kind of um, yeah financial for financialization and, and and that public transport is, as you said, a very um, safe uh, investment to uh, um, and that that, that that also needs to expand. Uh, to, to, to different places, and it is of course part of all these development programs um, to, in the end, and also bring uh, the technology uh, in, uh, to, to, to people and to, and to different cities. So um, I would uh, agree here. But what I find also fascinating is, I mean, for this you really need somehow this knowledge hub, right? You, you, you need somehow to convince people. I mean, uh, we, it was pretty clear yesterday that everyone said, I think, well, we, or also someone said it in the discuss, this discussion, we know that SAMP is not like this super cool uh, planning tool, but still we, we all want to, um, um, we, um, we, we have to apply it because we can profit from it. Um, so why is there this discourse of, of, of framing SAMPs as we are exceptional good and we have all the practices and we have all the knowledge? And I think the idea is really to have these, um, to have these, the 
European Union as as being like on the on the front line of uh, providing public transport technology knowledge, planning knowledge, and uh, and strategy and services. So um, and I think it was very successful in this this program. All right, thank you. Um, I think I saw a hand back there. Do, did you want to say, or it was just <laughs> your hand? Okay, so. Now, I propose that we have uh, five more minutes for uh, wrapping up so that we make a smooth transition to the next uh, round table. Any questions, please? Bermet, Bermet Burvava, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, very interesting, and I just want to ask you what is uh, what kind of knowledge production you can see as an alternative to this colonial uh, way of knowledge production. Well, I mean, I think to we, we we had it in Louise's talk today. So there is, of course, knowledge creation. There is, of course, there are way of informal mobilities. I mean, Leila yesterday, men uh, today mentioned uh, during, during, the, um, during the sidewalk how Mashrutka were so adapted to the city um, that they brought the granny to, to their door and they, they somehow had a policy that, that, that was door to door and now we are, we are, we are thinking about micro mobility offers uh, on demand services via smartphone and re-implementing something that is already there. Um, we had these, these micro rayons um, where you can organize Louisa made this point in her talk, where you actually have a lot of facilities there where you can somehow rethink mobility. So I think the city is full of uh, knowledge creation, on individual knowledge creation when, when, when walking and finding their ways and navigating space, um, which is not taken upon. Um, um, but yeah, these are just some, some first ideas. I, mean, I think it's also not my role to, to bring these alternative <laughs> ideas up and this alternative knowledge. But. Uh, hi, uh, Tony, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, I just was thinking about this city as well in this context. Yeah, we don't have some, but we kind of have some, yeah? Like in, in the sense that we have the philosophy and the main critique that uh, people who criticize the recent uh, changes in the city in terms of transport is that it is it kind of uh, it's just the one side and the other side the other philosophy of the city the development and the sprawl of the city it kind of nullifies the effect of the changes in the transport and you had the same comment about the other uh, the other city here yeah Tirana so I just want to ask if we can talk. If does the EU consider these uh, other things that happen in that city, like is it growing, is it shrinking, is the change, makeup of the city changing, how is it changing? I'm probably sure they do, but should we think also in, of SUMP as, should we basically th be thinking about SUMP in a more, like in a more minimal sense? It should be like a, a smaller part of a general what's going on this in the city not just like you know philosophy because it's like a really small part of what's going on in the, in the city transport generally is so that's my kind of i don't know comment um thanks uh, i i think that's a good point to also start criticizing me because of course all this um, uh, all this evaluating of of um, of the yeah, model shift and so on is not really taking into account how urbanization took place and you could also always make the argument at least we, we somehow tried to slow the process down that is that that, that is there anyway so um, and I'm I'm also ready to accept that um, of course there is this transport planning knowledge on integrated planning and to, to combine urban 
urbanization and tra urban planning and transport planning and um, so I think there there's no um, no need for, for for innovation there some is not particular I mean some is of course also also um, referring to this kind of literature and also includes it in, in its plan but from from the outcomes and I, f I find that I mean that's also interests me because again some as a, as, a, as a planning toolkit gives you all the opportunities but what comes out is always let's have cycling paths in the city center and um, so so it, it's really somehow in the process there is a reduction uh, of uh, of what could be done with the instrument in itself so yeah I think it's the right point to think about Elena, do you want to raise because a question or later? We will be transitioning. We'll, we'll transition. we will be transitioning to the round table. Elena will open it and uh, also make a comment on the sump related discussion. Uh, but at this point, we can invite the uh, three uh, speakers. Sura, David, and Nana. Sura, David, please come forward. And Nana. You should leave for sure. Uh, we can do it. Thank you. Um, so hello everyone again. Um, so this uh, session is about uh, the knowledge production and um, usage of external knowledge in the process of Tbilisi uh, mobility reforms or specifically also tra uh, public transport reforms. Um, before um, Going to roundtable again, I want to uh, make a small comment um, uh, about SAMP of Tbilisi. Um, Tbilisi, uh, work on Tbilisi SAMP started in 2017, I think. Um, as, an, it, as it was said, we still don't have the document right now, so it's very hard to um, uh, talk in details until we don't know, even know if it will, is, it's gonna be approved or not. Uh, but I just wanted to say about um, Tonio's uh, presentation that the, exactly what you said, there is, as a toolkit, it gives you so many possibilities. And in the beginning of the way of SAMP, I remember I was so um, excited. And all the way through, this excitement was um, disappearing uh, little by little. And in the end, if it's not approved, I'm not sure how much I would... Um, be uh, said sorry about that in a way, but I'm not 100% sure also about that. Um, but um, the, it, yeah, it's exactly the process of so many problems that you counted and how it's exaggerated in a compact manner through this uh, document that is promising to be very complex, but in the end uh, is, um, as we said uh, yesterday, is a kind of investment uh, plan um, of uh, big donor organizations into city infrastructure that disregards too many things um, to be, um, yeah, uh, to be useful. Um, uh, I don't know if David then later will have something to say about the process. Um, I still think in a way it could be saved um, uh, from that perspective to be listed some, but yeah, we'll see. We, a lot of discussions are uh, needed for that also, which is, are not happening. So it's very hard for me to speak also at this point on that. Um, okay, now uh, let's go to round table. Um, uh, so um, uh, like yesterday, uh, I will introduce little by little the participants uh, with each question. Um, it's a very important topic. Um, uh, yesterday in our presentation, we touched how, we are, how much we are um, dependent on external knowledge. Um, um, today on uh, Jav Jawadzeb uh, presentation or excursion, we mentioned also the um, instances how the international and ex external uh, um, experts helped us in uh, some of these uh, instances. Um, uh, as a Bigger picture still, I think that um, it's a very problematic uh, dependency, of course, like uh, we said yesterday. Uh, but um, to have give you more insight, it would be very valuable, I guess, to follow this process of Tbilisi reform and how this external knowledge played different roles uh, or 
um, was uh, promoting uh, different things uh, throughout the process. Um, so I will start the question uh, with Nana Adeshvili here. Nana is the um, um, freelance consultant. She's not specifically a, a technical expert of transport, but she's been working as a manager in um, um, many transport um, studies throughout the years. Uh, and when I started working in City Hall, she had also a project uh, with ADB at the time. And Nana um, has, uh, I think, from all uh, us sitting, the longest historical um, experience in, in, in terms of time timeline. Um, so I wanted to ask Nana, uh, start with Nana, exactly to have set this kind of um, historical I would say, background. Um, and talk a little bit about um, several stages, which I will all already name uh, what I think these stages are. One stage would be the uh, pre-reform stage, where tons of documents were done, overlapping, um, and put on the shelves, and what was happening then, and then when the reform started, um, and uh, when the reform gained the uh, real... Um, um, sp speed after probably Jar um, uh, not speed uh, in terms of implementation, but uh, more um, like publicly announcing this is what the reform will look like, um, and um, and not uh, these three timelines, but also how the actor um, power relations and uh, actor relationships. Uh, change during um, all these uh, three stages or other um, points as well, if it's clear, my question. Hello, hello everyone. Um, do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Closer, okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for in my, inviting me to your conference. Uh, it's true that, yeah, I've been involved in uh, Tbilisi transport projects since 2016. And uh, uh, I didn't even remember all the, all the studies we have been doing. And yesterday, I went through my uh, computer files to recall what we were doing. And I was really surprised how many <laughs> how many aspects of transport policy we touched that time. It's true that what Elena mentioned, the first stage, and I believe it started in 2015, when uh, uh, two documents were produced. The first one is uh, um, the Sustainable Ur Ur Urban Transport Planning Strategy, and uh, I believe it was approved by the Police uh, Council. And uh, the second uh, document was, uh, there was a bus study in Pelisi, which resulted in eventually in the purchase of the new blue, I think, 12 meter buses. Uh, and it was the, I would say, the first tangible result for uh, citizens of Tbilisi to see that the something is finally something is going on in the city. Uh, uh, as for that strategy, that strategy, although it was approved by the Pelisi Council, but it, this document was more used by uh, international financial organizations to develop different terms of references for further studies, and it was like a basis of the further intervention in the uh, urban transport policy. Uh, and, uh, of course, that document, the initial document, was overly optimistic. Uh, the short-term short plan included the stages which is still is uh, not implemented, and all of that had very objective uh, uh, justification what, why it wasn't done. This pre-reform phase was very interesting. I, I got involved into this project since 2016, and uh, uh, when uh, the first uh, document, which was about the restructuring and uh, uh, redesigning of the uh, bus uh, transport network in order to create, establish the new core network, 
which would be supported by uh, secondary and tertiary uh, systems. So when this uh, doc, it was a pre-feasibility study, and when it was in, uh, uh, when it was presented to the city hall, uh, the reaction was that uh, the mayor and everybody, yes, they were very supportive. They were saying, yes, this is very good, but the reaction was very. Uh, 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 pessimistic in a term that uh, it wa it's not for police, this is good, but it's for Europe, not for us. And uh, uh, really the, uh, the, the commitment was not built, but I would say that the first three years really uh, uh, resulted in the change of mentality in police city hall. Uh, employees who were um, working on the transport uh, transport issues, uh, and that um, uh, they were uh, themselves uh, uh, themselves they were admitting it that their uh, change in mentality uh, in uh, how this transport policy should be should be uh, uh, changed and what is the uh, sustainable transport policy and how it should be uh, this car oriented society should move to the uh, pedestrian oriented society the bus transport and the whole hierarchy of the transport uh, modality so that that was uh, step by step it was admitted by the uh, by, by by the and it was the first step I mean it was very difficult to talk about the public because the first stage was to really uh, uh, get understanding within the within the city hall, uh, the and it resulted in 2018, I believe, that the new mayor announced the uh, public uh, the uh, new transport policy, uh, and it was really a turning point, as Elena said, and. Uh, initiated many, many, many projects. Uh, a, lot of proje a lot of projects were in technical assistance, and including the training. The training was in every aspect of transport policy. And because it had to really change every aspect of the urban planning, and the resources were, of course, minimal. minimal. There are still not enough resources. And uh, we were trying to convince uh, the city hall that they should be a, uh, they should build the transport authority, uh, and eventually they have uh, established this agency, which is kind of quasi transport authority, but still it was a big step forward in concentrating the resources in order to move forward the reform. So that was the second stage, and the, uh, uh, the third stage, I, I believe, started probably from during the COVID, yeah, when there was this, as Elena said, the uh, very tangible result of the creation of uh, on Chavchavadze Avenue uh, of these bus lines, and uh, also the the bus lines were created in other places like Shartava, here around the uh, this area where we are here. Uh, yeah, Gladani. So that pe people really started to see what what does it mean? What was uh, the announced announced uh, new reform really meant for them? And I think it was shared. Uh, but the, right now we realized, and City Hall realizes, the communication of the uh, new bus network is really insufficient in the society, and it's a very weak point. And right now, the city hall, with the again with the uh, foreign experts, are um, working on development of the new communication system, uh, and it also requires more resources. And everything, actually, everything you say, it uh, the impediment and the obstacles of not having enough resources for such a for such a radical, it's a radical reform in terms of everything has to be changed. Uh, and uh, it's a really radical restructuring of not only in the, uh, in the investments, in the everything in the planning activity, but, but also mentality of the, of the citizens. Yeah. Um, can I 
check how much time we have per uh, presenter. Okay, maybe we'll go through questions and then we'll have a lot of time after the next um, Thank you, Nana. And um, uh, the next sitting uh, is David Jayani. He's head, uh, Deputy Head of Transport and Urban Development Agency. Um, so the agency that Nana was mentioning that, uh, so Transport Department turning into an agency. Um, and uh, me and David have been working also together uh, and uh, he's the main person who um, works with all this on the planning side, so all with the, all international expertise, etc. Um, it's clear that the uh, expertise in City Hall increased, but um, yeah, I wanted to ask you um, uh, your point of view, how... Um, uh, uh, one one thing I wanted to mention also is that while I was working in City Hall, I think it's important, um, uh, our unit was called Policy and Planning Unit, which was then uh, changed the name and it's called now International Projects Unit. Uh, but it does the same thing, uh, com communicates with uh, external consultancies to plan the uh, transport policy. So this switch of name is also um, a bit indicative of what happens uh, usually instead of being responsible for your own policy and planning, you are kind of the medium, uh, very often can be a medium uh, between international actors, etc. So building on that, um, yeah, in this whole process, like how much, uh, we talked a lot about this external dependency already, uh, but also about uh, lack of knowledge uh, inside City Hall and a lot of problems of keeping the staff. Um, so City Hall having problems of um, institutional um, knowledge um, increase. And uh, one small comment also, because SAMP is a very good example of this, maybe challenges and problems. Uh, if uh, you feel comfortable at this point to talk about, uh, refer to SAMP as well. So, good uh, evening, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for, for inviting and thanks for organizing this kind of uh, uh, event uh, uh, in an academic uh, Area because uh, um, lacking, uh, uh, I would say, uh, the, uh, direct, direct to begin the direct answers to the to the question, uh, lacking academic support, which means that lacking uh, academic uh, knowledge uh, in this sphere is one of the main uh, problems uh, uh, in this direction uh, to 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 talk about. Uh, the sustainability of the reforms. So uh, all these uh, issues uh, uh, and challenges that were mentioned, that all uh, go and uh, can can be united under one uh, term, which is sustainability of, of the reform. And also this is tied with the SAMP and why we uh, try to have uh, SAMP uh, as a as a um, like European SAMP, which was just. Uh, uh, discussed as a model for our transport strategy because there might be different forms and shapes and formats of the strategy, uh, but we thought uh, this would be most appropriate. Uh, we think that uh, this, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to very proudly mention that we indeed uh, we indeed have a huge pool of experts and we are very sincerely, sincerely uh, thankful to, to, to all of them throughout the years, as Nana uh, correctly uh, mentioned. Uh, and now what uh, we definitely are uh, doing uh, is, uh, is that there is, uh, first of all, coordination between these uh, different projects. Uh, and then um, what, what I mentioned, the sustainability, which for now, of course, stays uh, as a uh, main challenge because we, uh, uh, when, when getting, uh, getting uh, new um, staff to the, to the agency and previously to the municipal transport department, uh, they, um, always, uh, unfortunately, first uh, challenge is to get 
uh, the relevant uh, uh, professional, and then to uh, to maintain uh, to 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 have have her or him uh, at, the, at the spot on, not to be hijacked by some private. Uh, uh, private company, which happens quite often, and uh, when it happens, of course, it uh, it uh, derails uh, uh, lots of processes internally, and uh, um, so it's it's a huge challenge to the building up on pri like principal uh, um, policies, transport policies, of course, and uh, also building a certain institutional. Uh, capacity and institutional uh, knowledge also that uh, step by step has to be created in this uh, in this uh, city uh, however uh, of course uh, we, we we look uh, although it is a ch challenge for today we think that uh, as time goes by and uh, all, as all the uh, directions all the reforms uh, uh, in, that are that, that are uh, rolling out in many directions uh, in this uh, city, um, continue. We will we will at some point uh, 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 go like the go to the into the uh, improved situation because uh, I uh, very much uh, we everyone pretty much uh, remember that several uh, years ago uh, on the uh, on the uh, how many maybe five kilometers from here from from this very building. To, till till a uh, metro Avlabari, which is we counted once, uh, there was only four, and it is more than five kilometers, as I remember, only four zebra crossings. So, and it it was it was happening just um, I don't know maybe five years ago, and now we have uh, 15 only on Jav Javadze uh, Avenue. This is a small example, but this timing is uh, very important, as Nana also mentioned when when we are talking about lack of resources, which is, I think, pretty much uh, common for um, all, all the cities, especially if they are undergoing certain reform. Uh, these, re uh, these resources are time, first of all, human resources, and uh, uh, financial uh, resources. Uh, all uh, that, that is another um, sump uh, will be, uh, we think, another way to tackle this uh, challenge. So. Why, why we need uh, SAMP, uh, the very finalized version of it and adopted one, uh, because it will help us also somehow to navigate throughout these challenges, because there won't be a time when all the resources are there and we, we do not elect something, but this uh, long-term strategy will give us a better understanding when to tackle this or that Challenge. This is also uh, very uh, important uh, when we talk about having a, a longer uh, strategy. Also, uh, with the SAMP, it is important that uh, that uh, we had uh, we had to begin when uh, it was mentioned the mayor's new transport policy was uh, announced. We had to begin uh, in parallel with number of different uh, reforms, not only one. So we do not have a, I don't know, year of the metro reform and then year of the bus reform and then year of uh, parking reform. Um, unfortunately, uh, all this uh, was to be tackled at the same time. So we have 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 begun certain reforms with uh, uh, in, in all, all the fronts. And that is where uh, additionally uh, we, we had huge assistance and hope also of our uh, international donors, uh, governments, uh, development agencies, IFIs, and so on, and, 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 and our uh, consultants. Because otherwise that was unimaginable uh, to happen. And uh, lastly, also on, on this point, uh, it is to be mentioned that uh, other than these sub-challenges that we mentioned about the resource, the main challenge here in the city uh, about, the, about moving and transforming to the uh, sustainable transport, sustainable urban mobility general, is that all this, what we are talking about, is very new to this city, is not very new, but it's absolutely new to this city. 
This means that uh, it is absolutely new to the citizens, it is absolutely new to the government and municipal officials, it is absolutely new to the academia. So none of them uh, are, are ready for this. There was no preparation, I don't know, period for this or certain talks or, I don't know, conferences, symposium, and so, so, so on. So uh, this, this is a huge challenge. This, uh, the, that is why, for us, our communication with uh, people like Nana and her team and lots of our consultants from, uh, from all over the world, uh, really beginning from DC, World Bank, to South Korea and China, JICA, for example, uh, Oh, that, that, is, that is very important, not only with, in terms of material assistance and support, but also the pre talking, for talking about principles, for identifying about uh, uh, principles, identifying the relevant uh, uh, tools to, to insert these principles in the context of Tbilisi, which, uh, which definitely is the uh, main work, I would say, uh, for the for the agency because um, every everyone knows what is what is what is more sustainable what uh, what kind of urban mobility will be better for I don't know people pedestrians uh, public transport users uh, for the air ecology economy and so on but uh, the whole no one knows how to put put it there in their own city because. Uh, it is very good to look at different best practices, but uh, all, all the cities are uh, quite different. And uh, lastly, it is uh, uh, to be mentioned that these years have shown us that everything that uh, works in other uh, Western cities or other cities that, are, uh, that, 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 that have policies dedicated to the sustainable mobility, all the tools that they are using work perfectly also uh, here in Tbilisi, so uh, this because this this was uh, uh, there was a huge uh, uh, miscommunication, uh, I would say, about this. Uh, Tbil this is okay in Amsterdam, Copenhagen, um, somewhere Kyoto, but uh, here in Tbilisi, it uh, it won't work. That uh, proved to be uh, untrue, so to say, and uh, this is this is very good. This is why we. Uh, are going to continue in, in, in this way, are going to bring in more, more expertise where uh, we are able uh, and where we get support uh, from uh, our international or internal uh, stakeholders, government, uh, different IFIs and consultants, uh, because uh, really everything this showed a very tangible, uh, as Nana mentioned, uh, uh, results, and uh, that is what we are going uh, to continue. Thank you, uh, David. Um, now, um, Zura, it's your turn. Uh, Zura is also our colleague. Um, he's a transport planner, and he's representing the probably the only uh, consultancy uh, in Georgia who works on this, uh, has the capacity of working on, um, on the side of transport planning that is uh, like sustainable mobility and not uh, roads or highways. Um, and um, as a representative of only consultancy, I would say, um, I want to ask um, like two things. How are the creation and um, uh, expansion of uh, this company or, or the expertise in this company is connected uh, also to this uh, reform uh, and to this investments, etc. Um, and in a more long uh, term, uh, what uh, prospects do we see? Um, do we see if lo more local companies like this appear, more contextual knowledge appearing, more uh, that could di be diverted to more fairer city? Um, uh, or uh, what other challenges uh, do we see on the road to that? Thank you, Elena. Hello, everyone. Um, Ms. Rabiradze, as um, Elena mentioned, the technical director and transport planning uh, specialist uh, of STS, uh, transport consultancy company, which is uh, maybe 
the only company, as Elena mentioned, but uh, yeah, maybe the biggest uh, company in Georgia. It's an honor to to be, uh, but uh, big responsibility also, and you understand it, because we have a lot of uh, joint projects, had uh, joint projects together. Um, as a connection between this uh, ongoing reform and uh, um, STS, I can say several uh, topics about it. Uh, I think that it's uh, uh, STS had a really uh, positive impact on on this whole reform because there was uh, no expertise in transport sector and especially in this sector, Elena, even you remember that because we actually together started this reform. Uh, I, I'm not saying that we started, but we were uh, at the time, you were in the city hall and I was in the private sector. I also um, worked uh, in the, I, I have to mention that I also uh, worked in the city hall and uh, my expertise and a big portion of this knowledge was actually taken from there because there were the, uh, very tailored trainings and uh, about sustainability. It was the first steps, uh, and I it was the actually uh, first time I I understood what was really sustainable urban mobility. I I sh I must mention because I'm from private sector and I can. Uh, talk more freely here because at uh, at uh, traffic engineering uh, traffic uh, organization department uh, the understanding of traffic was only cars at the time and I remember this point and when when this change happened my mind said that no it's not only traffic and you should also consider the other users of the streets. Um, to get back to the connect to the question, um, I think that uh, it's uh, it's like for the city, it's uh, uh, it's comfort to have a company like us. Um, you can refuse, Mr. David, or you can accept. Um, but if there would. If there was more companies, of course, I think from my point of view, it would be better because it means more uh, competitive uh, discussions, more competitive um, uh, understandings and so on. But I think that the market is not uh, big enough for uh, many companies uh, at the time. Uh, for today, for for example, but maybe for tomorrow and for the next years, there will be some uh, more uh, more fundings because I, I have to uh, mention fundings because it's a crucial point for uh, existence such a company for such a company like uh, us. Uh, um, maybe I'm very direct and maybe it's not uh, <laughs> it's not uh, real, uh, but, uh, tailored for such a auditory or such a uh, discussion and it should be more uh, academic but I think that yeah we have a lot of uh, academic uh, person it in our team and uh, we have a lot of academic uh, uh, academic experience in our uh, foreigner and international friends, uh, which uh, and they are sharing their experience and knowledge with us. Uh, um, but still, we have to somehow have ability to finance, the, to have, to exist and. Uh, it's very difficult to keep uh, transport experts and modeling experts, which maybe you know that it's uh, not cheap uh, labor. It's like very expensive and even rich countries and cities uh, cannot afford to uh, keep this kind of uh, stuff. 
for a long time. So somehow I think that uh, uh, it has, STS had a very uh, good impact and a very positive impact on, you uh, know, in, in general on this reform. Um, um, and it's ongoing and I, I think that I think that I answered your question, Elena. Someone and yeah, um, for for building the knowledge and for the uh, for the perspective, it's very um, it's very important to have uh, experts like, for example, Torben Heinemann which is, I think, a uh, team member for City Hall and STS because he's really helping us. And I'm not, uh, I'm not saying uh, personally about uh, Torben Heinemann, but I think that it is the most effective way to uh, build uh, here the knowledge to, uh, because there, we had a lot of studies, we had participated in these studies, we have grown. Uh, but still, when when you have the international expert uh, with such a huge experience, uh, and when you have it on in your in your office, and you you can work with him and ask him a question every day, it's a huge asset for us, for the country, and for the city. I think, um, and uh, I must definitely. Uh, also mentioned that uh, only international experts, and we had a lot of discussions about it, is not enough, and it's really uh, it's really important point to develop the knowledge here, and uh, it means that I think that we also we already have some knowledge, and I think that we already have uh, enough knowledge, inter uh, national on national and local level that uh, somehow the funding IFIs and the funding organizations can also, and maybe the city also can change the uh, strategy of funding and somehow uh, make, uh, give more benefits to local experts also. Because maybe uh, we, also, we already can understand and somehow criticize this international knowledge also because there are a lot of risks to directly copy the international knowledge uh, exper uh, experience here and it should be uh, definitely um, adapted to local experience which I think local people understand better in any countries and uh, yeah I think that's all from my side. Um, yeah, <laughs> questions, Leila, um, are you, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm overstepping and uh, stealing the first question, um, abusing my moderator rights. Uh, but first of all, thanks to all three of you for this very clear and sincere engagement. And I just wanted with uh, Zura to specify, actually this last point that you're mentioning is I think very important one, right? You can, you might always need certain knowledge from outside the country. And no matter how strong build the institutions we will build, and hopefully Tbilisi will, and other cities in the, in the country will, there will also always be certain things that you will have to learn, but to, especially to make such import of knowledge and expertise relevant for the local context you need to in the first place it was mentioned yesterday you need to understand what you're engaging with as i understand also from our work with elena already in the process of implementing this reform and this is maybe also a bit a question to to david um, already a lot of things that were offered by international organizations or financial institutions were adapted precisely because City Hall was already staffing itself and understanding, um, you know, what were the, the, the offers that 
would not pass, that would not be useful without adjusting it. So my question first to Zura is like, what are examples of what you have been arguing for, right? What are, what are the examples that you can recall where this meeting local knowledge produced better outcomes than would be produced only by relying on uh, uh, externally or imported uh, knowledge. And in a way, maybe David also could uh, reflect or give us examples uh, of this. How does it help City Hall to have internal institutional knowledge when engaging with external organizations and financial institutions? Should I also collect, Vladimir, a question from you? If it's a linking, I'm ju I just would ask if there is a linking question, I would take it. Somewhat linking, then we will keep you in. Yeah, I was uh, also very much intrigued by your uh, by your last uh, proposal that you say, well, you have to, well, basically there is the staff and there is the expertise and there is already the, the, the knowledge there. So, uh, but uh, then, What's uh, so? What's the problem then, actually? So, uh, w w what uh, can we then say about the other factors, uh, about uh, I don't know, political will? Uh, so w how does the system has to function so that uh, the capacity and uh, the knowledge can come uh, to application, so that it really is counted? So, what 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 else you need as a working environment then? I can answer easily. We can ju we we must work. It's just a process, and I think that as David also mentioned, we are on the right way, and we are developing our future in Tbilisi and in Georgia. But uh, also to um, to link to the to your question uh, is that uh, it's also a very simple answer. Maybe there will be a lot of um, examples in my experience. Uh, but I think that when, when you are living in the specific place and you are de developing the strategy of, or, of tra public transportation and so on, um, you also feel it better and you also consider that I'm, I, I will live here and it somehow works because we. Um, I see that when I communicate to, uh, to my colleagues in the, for example, in not only in Tbilisi, in Batumi, in the in the other cities, they see that uh, the international experts know a lot. Uh, they listen to them. They know and they maybe they understand that they are right. But uh, when it's translated to Georgian, and when it's translate, when it's translated, not not only just language translation, when it's translated and when it's explained by the Georgian um, professional, I think it's more affecting and it's maybe good or bad. I don't know, but it's really uh, I can say that uh, in my experience, it's it works. And um, mm, to answer more uh, on your question is that I think that uh, there is enough uh, political will uh, at David's level, for example, what I, what I see and what I touch every day. And uh, maybe there are, there are more complicated uh, questions and uh, I don't know articles on the higher level uh, decision makers maybe because I really see that there is a direct understanding of every um, international advice or international strategy document on uh, from David's side and not only David I'm saying that uh, at the uh, level of the professionals and uh, mm, at yeah, the city hall. So I don't know, I really think that it's a process and we have to work more and more and it's a uh, time, it, it needs more time. Uh, if I also may add, uh, I will begin from the 
last question. One, once again, to, to mention the, the main challenge that is there, and I think will be for several years, is the sustainability. Sustainability, not, not as a having a green transport policy, but have a sustainable transport policy, which mm, does not change every year or second or when new mayor arrives or I don't know, other deputy mayor changes. Yes, this is this is a this is the issue, uh, main challenge, and then of course it is tied to other sub uh, challenges, as I as I call it. Uh, also, uh, with uh, when uh, during the every everyday work, for first first of all, it has to be mentioned while current our inter, in, in, uh, internal uh, expert integrated expert uh, was mentioned, which is uh, from Leipzig. Uh, by the way, uh, with the support of uh, GIZ, we had this uh, mm, this uh, type, this format of uh, communication and uh, capacity building uh, s since several years already. We also had uh, uh, previously uh, representatives from Mott McDonald as the uh, as the as integrated experts, and it is a super opportunity which worked. Uh, perfectly in our case because uh, because uh, other than this is uh, the the uh, perfect uh, opportunity to work on the very concrete cases uh, on the city with uh, an international expert it's, it also definitely serves as a uh, on job training and uh, we we which which at the end of the day contributes uh, to the issue of having uh, better qualified uh, staff uh, and have, have them sus sustainably. It is not a uh, one-day training, two-day training, or I don't know, now online training, also the novelty that we have now. Yeah, which, which, which are good, uh, perfect, but uh, not that effective time-wise. Uh, so um, uh, also to mention what might be the differences between international knowledge and lo local one as i as i mentioned uh, all the main principles all almost all uh, that have been uh, that we have investigated or someone has brought from the best practices or their cities to tbilisi definitely work here but uh, the differences might arise when we talk about implementation so this is more technical uh, level differences because someone knows, uh, I don't know, better uh, the local context, someone knows uh, where the people might be more interested to stand and wait for the bus. And the, the other is the principle that it is better, for example, just uh, as, as well as for example, that some, we, we know, everyone knows that uh, if we have a bus lane in the center, like median bus lane, it is very good. It is not hampered, not stopped, and so on. But uh, on a local basis, you might have a, I don't know, history of there having a bus stop somewhere on the edge or something like this. So mostly these differences are on, on this level, technical level, and that is where this cooperation uh, works perfectly. Other than this, Generally, and uh, on the level of the principles of the sustainable transport policy, uh, every, um, every, everything uh, works in Tbilisi perfectly, and we have not indicated any uh, understanding or principle of the um, contemporary transport, sustainable transport planning that uh, is absolutely uh, unimaginable to be implemented in Tbilisi. Uh, first of all, thank you for your directedness. <laughs> um, and I have a question about selection process. Uh, how did you... I, I can imagine that there is sort of a le legislative procedure when, when state um, issued sort of a requirement for international companies and then, then apply and then win and all the rest of it. But I'm interested in um, underpinnings of this process. What kind of... Um, features that international consultants uh, have um, are the most valuable for Tbilisi City Hall, for instance, 
um, what kind of uh, skills are required and why did you choose exact companies and did not choose others? Thank you. I'll take one more question and then give you the words. So uh, you very well describe how the local lo knowledge that created then it goes to the private institution. In, for the country, it's not the bad, but for the city hall, this is the problematic. So uh, in the perfect world, how you will set or what is your, um, I would say, priority set the things in a way that um, this does not happen. So uh, if you get in a power, what are the actions you will do, like one or two? And also for the SDC representatives, for me, it will be also interesting to understand uh, how you think, uh, what, uh, because, uh, as you said, we have no market and we have no competition uh, in this way, what kind of um, different um, um, uh, working tools with the government should be uh, I imported? Because right now, if I understand, you are working under the Georgian law where each your action requires uh, separate tender action, which I understand it's not that nicest. So do you have think what you want in a way to provide much more efficient service uh, from the government with less administrative cost, but more input into the content? Was the first question for David and the second for uh, for Zura. And I would say that for the first question, maybe we also could ask Nana, because this is just a very nice imaginative question, like what would you do in this situation, right? Uh, uh, yes, I will. Uh, so for the uh, pro processing part, uh, first of all, it has to be mentioned that absolute majority of the uh, tendering uh, for getting the international consultants is uh, done according to the rules of the relevant IFI or government that is supporting this uh, direction. So here we do not have a lot to do with the Georgian uh, law uh, on, on procurement, on public um, procurements. But uh, uh, to content-wise, uh, um, I do not think that uh, there is any difference that we are we are we are seeking there when put in their terms of reference other than uh, I'm pretty sure it is uh, common for all, all the cities it is experience uh, in the relevant matter uh, mostly and uh, and and uh, not not only not only general experience that some a company is good at something generally and we as i mentioned are very proud that we work with the giants uh, in, in in this direction but that uh, the team that is assigned proposed to be assigned from them on on the local which will be the, the assigned to our project will be more will have more or less a, a, a relevant uh, experience and qualifications that that we need because this is a this is a challenge pretty much uh, big companies can win big uh, procurements with their big names and then uh, you might have on the on the uh, on in the municipality in the city you might get the team which is not that much experience so that is uh, uh, what to be like uh, emphasized or uh, under under focus when we look at the offers um, of, of 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 these companies. Yeah, pretty much when if we talk about the demands, we do not have any any big demands. This what I mentioned. What the local team will be uh, local. I mean assigned to Tbilisi team, not generally that I don't know what McDonald or some other company has some good experts, but what, who will be the people who will be working in, in Tbilisi? This is the uh, 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 issue. It is uh, very problematic, generally, uh, because uh, Tbilisi is not a big market. For example, two days ago, we opened a, a metro station, which was rehabilitated for two years because uh, 
first uh, company could not do it, that then the second one could not do it, and uh, um, uh, you just cannot uh, get uh, the better because you are limited, of course, in the, with this legislative framework also, and internationals do not step in. So this is this is uh, quite uh, problematic. Yep. Mm. Uh, I would start that um, the main problem, I think, uh, is that the biggest projects are financed by the international, it's international money, and uh, we cannot, uh, like, control the, um, yeah, the tendering process, and we, we cannot uh, big impact and influence on it, on, on it, and it's like it it should be understood on the national level i think that uh, it's time to somehow change the portion again i'm i'm talking very directly because uh, really the, it it causes a lot of problems because the same expert engineer for example international and national the difference between the uh, between the uh, Daily rates is three or four times more than the local one, mm, and you will not collect the, the local knowledge here, which we were discussed, uh, because it directly shows that the international uh, international expert is very prioritized in the project, and the roles also are uh, distributed proportionally. So, and we had already the uh, projects in Georgia and in Tbilisi where there was a tendering directly by the city hall where we uh, uh, mm, uh, we hired international companies as a, our complement or our um, how to say yeah, support. Yeah, international support. And I think that the process is going much more better. And the knowledge is uh, is collected and, uh, uh, how to say, stay, is, is developed in Georgia in this way. But the problem, again, is that the country does not have maybe enough money for, uh, for such a big and huge projects but in in some case maybe uh, if if the if the if it would be local if it would be local money the, it would cost less also maybe because of many reasons and i will not dive into m many details now if i would ask nana if she wanted to also reflect on this question of uh, if you had all the policy power, <laughs> how would you step into this situation? And then we can take still last okay. question from Vladimir. Actually, it's not entirely true because we should differentiate between two different tendering processes. One, when is the loan uh, is tendered with the loan money and another with the grant money. When it is tendered the grant money, uh, the project is financed by grant money. Uh, there are the client is the international organization, financial or the government, international government, and the in this case, for example, the city hall is the beneficiary. And during the tender procedure, beneficiary doesn't have a say. Uh, but when it is the project is financed by the loan money, this is entirely different story. You actually have a big say, but unfortunately, uh, governments don't know that. And they are passive. And uh, they can actually in influence or very much on selection procedure, and what is more important on the result of the project. Uh, and I know that because uh, 
I am 30 years in the consulting business and I was a director of the World Bank project financed by the loan. And I myself uh, uh, fired the consulting company when it was not performing. So that can be done. Uh, and uh, it's, um, so you actually can really demand what do you want when, uh, because it is your, it's a loan and it is your money and you, nobody can really dictate you uh, what do you want, how, what kind of result do you, uh, do you want in this, uh, uh, in this project. Can I add quickly something to what Nana said, very important? One thing that us, uh, even in cases, for example, when the government is the client, it can be a different branch of government. So, for example, a sustainable urban mobility plan um, uh, for Tbilisi. Tbilisi didn't have any uh, official um, say in choosing the consultant in tendering process because ADB specifically has the rule that the procurement can be done by the uh, government body which uh, is uh, ticking some procurement boxes, uh, their internal procurement uh, rule boxes. And in case of Tbilisi, that was Municipal Development Fund, which was region, uh, state government agency. And we had no say uh, over the outcome, uh, to be honest. And um, and another question is, it's that the debt agency, very great people, but they don't have any knowledge in uh, urban mobility. So how can uh, these people assess um, the um, uh, gram process, procedure for Tbilisi? Um, so it, there are big pictures, but also there are so many problems like that on the way uh, in this kind of processes. Yes, but that we can be negotiating. Nego negotiated during the negotiation process with the international financial organization how what kind of relationship should be w between the client and beneficiary and when client has the say or an or approval of the project that that should be negotiated by the government so what i want to say yeah government has uh, leverage when it the project is financed by the loan and Sometimes they don't use this leverage. This is what yeah. I want to say. Um, I think we have last, hopefully, short question from Vladimir, and then. Well, I, I don't know if the question might be short, but I, I think I would love to engage in a very long discussion with you on this. Um, uh, since we have been talking about costs and uh, you've uh, said uh, uh, talk about uh, daily rates, what I would uh, just like to know, and perhaps this just uh, blows off the limit, is the um, um, implication on the consultancy costs that or the consultancy structures and the tendering structures uh, on the... Um, project costs on the implementation costs at the end. You might have uh, heard of the uh, Metro uh, cost uh, um, report, uh, on, uh, which has been published a couple of weeks ago, in a, uh, which uh, has compared uh, Metro construction costs throughout the world. And uh, the benchmark uh, was basically that uh, if you have a very heavy share of consultancies and a very weak government uh, oversight, then uh, the construction cost, costs are just terribly high. The question is basically to you whether you can assess that with, uh, say, more in-house capacity, that with a stronger oversight, that with a, uh, less um, consultancy involvement, you perhaps you might have had different costs, for instance, for the uh, Chav Chavaj um, Avenue bus lanes. Or uh, do, you, do you have, uh, or at least, say, a comparison retrospectively in cost per kilometers uh, for the reconstruction of, of Chav Chavadze? When you compare, say, to other BRT projects, when you can say, well, but this has been other people's money, that uh, so we were able just to spend three times that we would have spent otherwise. So, uh, Chavadze is not a good example for that, these bus lanes, because they were uh, done by us, like state budget it, itself. There was the uh, money, uh, loan money was uh, spent on uh, on writing the report for the new, completely new integrated bus uh, study, 
public transport study, and there's a bus, I mean, both minibus and bus, and uh, the metro, now all the integrated systems, the new network that has been, uh, has been uh, redeveloped. So this was uh, done, uh, if we talk particularly in this direction, this was done uh, with the support of the uh, EBRD uh, and Sistra was a consultant on, uh, on that. And then we are implementing uh, this, uh, and this is uh, the implementation itself is done uh, by, the, by the municipal uh, budget, state budget. But, uh, so that is why this is not a good example, but generally, uh, we, I do not uh, remember that uh, uh, we do this uh, kind of uh, uh, this uh, kind of study. For, I mean, uh, to to then recalculate what it would be without the without the international uh, engagement. As I, if I understood the uh, question correctly, but uh, one other thing is that like two, two points on this, that mostly we do studies which are, uh, which are not uh, infra infrastructural and concern the policy for now, but we will, after we have all this, then we will go into, into infrastructure also. And secondly, we look, uh, and this, uh, uh, under we here, uh, I mean not only the agency, but the city hall and then the national government also, because as you know, all this, uh, grants and uh, loans come through a, through the government of Georgia from a national level because all these loans are sovereign loans, not uh, loans to the uh, municipality. So that is why under we, we I mean all these layers mm, that there there are procedures which uh, which uh, uh, prevent that the issues that can be settled and done by our internal expertise and possibilities uh, uh, will, will, will go into, uh, into the loan uh, budget or loan uh, basket. Uh, so that, that is the second point. As a rule, uh, uh, seeking some uh, financial assistance uh, means that uh, it is uh, almost impossible to be, to be done with the local Money and but also uh, also the knowledge, knowledge uh, of the content on a local level. Now that we named, now that we went deeper and deeper in naming the problems, <laughs> um, before we get to further solutions, I think we should be closing this panel, right? Um, I am very, very grateful for your presence and indeed, as many of us mentioned, very sincere and brave engagement with these pretty tough topics that we've been discussing today. Uh, I'm keeping fingers crossed that some of the problems that you've articulated so well will be over time addressed. Um, we will have also tomorrow, and you're all very much in, welcome and invited to stay part of these discussions. Uh, now I would ask everybody, not everybody, all, part, all, all symposium participants, I cannot extend um, the invite to the entire, to all the public attending here, uh, but surely I would like to ask you that we rush to the dinner location and then we will only have an hour. Uh, I wanted to spread Vladim, uh, Lubomir's um, request to share that some of the contracts from the participants can be signed throughout the dinner one by one and some others perhaps tomorrow. Um, thanks again and let's uh, rush towards the Rustavelli metro station. Thank you.